Next, <clears throat> we welcome Lucia Hindorf to the podium. And she's going to talk to you about a concept with two RFAs for the collaborative data integration and analysis of polygenic risk scores from populations of a diverse ancestry. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to present this concept for you today. Fundamentally, this concept is about three things. It's about using existing genomic data that are associated with health and disease, a lot of it. It's about analyzing individuals with data from diverse populations, a lot of them. And then it's about bringing these two things together to improve the prediction of polygenic risk scores. So, Many of us are no doubt familiar with the idea of polygenic risk scores, the idea that you can take weighted sums of many SNPs, sometimes even up to millions, to predict the risk of a health or disease measure in an individual is not a new one. However, the recent influx of GWAS data has resulted in a influx of a lot of papers about polygenic risk scores recently. So they include obesity, coronary artery disease, longevity, type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and cancer, just to name a few. However, there is one shortcoming of many of these publications, and that is that PRS are shown to, to have poor prediction in non-European populations. There are several studies that have shown this um, consistently. I'm showing you data from one here. This is a study from Martin and colleagues of prediction across 17 different anthroponeptic and blood panel traits. So what I'm showing here on the y-axis is the prediction accuracy relative to Europeans. On the x-axis is various population groups. And then the violin plots show the distribution of these prediction accuracy estimates with the um, point being the average and then the bars representing the standard errors. And so what hopefully you can see from this is that there is clearly relative, relatively lower prediction accuracy relative to that European dot on the to upper left there. So in American and South Asian populations, you see about 60-fold uh, less prediction, uh, poorer prediction. In East Asians, it's about half. And then in Africans, it's a quarter. So this is really showing a shortcoming of the existing GWAS data um, to be able to use these scores for prediction. Although I, in an ideal world, we would go back and generate all of the GWAS data we need to be able to do good PRS, in reality, there's probably a lot that we can do with the data we already have. These include summary statistics data, which can be used for PRS prediction, including from sources uh, such as US or UK data repositories, large-scale studies such as the UK Biobank, or aggregators of summary statistics data such as the GWAS catalog. We also have a number of large-scale efforts to genotype as well, or sequence as well as collect phenotype data. These include uh, sequencing efforts such as the CCDGs or TopMed, as well as large-scale genotyping efforts such as the PAGE program. And then finally, there is likely to be a bolus of what I'm calling hard-to-get data, which includes data from industry efforts, such as the direct-to-consumer efforts that are publishing GWAS um, in the same scientific journals that academic and other efforts are. These also include international studies, which are also publishing GWAS, but perhaps do not have their data as available as some of the studies that are funded uh, through NIH. So we come to this concept, then, that has two major goals. The first goal is to leverage genetic diversity to improve the applicability of PRS across diverse populations for a broad range of health and disease measures. And then the second is sort of this more operational goal of optimizing the integration of these large-scale harmonized gen genomic and phenotype data to facilitate collaborative analysis and dissemination of these PRS-related data, as well as to facilitate development of related resources. So we believe that this is an opportune time for NHGRI to become invested in this for several reasons. So first of all, sample size is a key determinant of PRS performance. And we know that there are a lot of smaller GWAS and even among larger GWAS, smaller subsets of non-European data. And aggregating these together for collaborative analysis is likely to vastly improve the performance of PRS prediction. <coughs> Second, summary statistics uh, can be used in lieu of individual level data. There are obvious limitations to this approach, but this approach may help circumvent some of the challenges with sharing individual level data. Um, 
Thir the third uh, factor here is, is one that NHGRI really takes to heart, which is that once you figure out how to do an approach like PRS in diverse populations for one disease, you can likely apply what you learn to multiple health of disease measures. There's likely to be a lot of synergy here. There's been a real appetite for translating what have typically been epidemiological studies in PRS to the clinical setting, and we think that this is a good time to be generating these kinds of data for use um, in translational settings. And then finally, we're aware of a number of nascent efforts to um, get global cohorts together. And they've identified some of the challenges uh, related to data sharing. We think that having an RFA in this area would really help um, incentivize those efforts to, to get going. OK, so at the heart of the concept then are two RFAs. So the first one I'll describe is for the PRS centers, or PRSCs. So a PRSC is one application that represents one or mo more cohorts. Each application needs to have at least one non-European ancestry group with at least 10,000 participants, or if they have at least 20,000 participants, to have at least 50,000 of those from non-European ancestry populations. And this is really to ensure that the data um, are both large, there are large numbers of individuals, as well as they're not overwhelmingly biased by the European ancestry population uh, participants that we see in GWAS studies. Beyond that, we propose several programmatic criteria for high program priority, including at least 50,000 participants. This is to incentivize existing cohorts and consortia to come together, a large numbers of non-European ancestry participants, broad phenotype information, um, which for the time being we're defining as multiple health and disease measures, and then commitment to data sharing, either data that are already available or would agree be agreed to be shared as part of this consortium. Okay, so I wanted to sh talk through the PRSCs um, as, as an example, because as I mentioned, what we want to do to incentivize existing efforts who are already doing a lot of phenotype harmonization and a lot of analysis to come together. Uh, these could be groups that are already organized around a common phenotype uh, or maybe common infrastructure sequencing or uh, computational or perhaps a common scientific question. So here's a, a few ways that this could work. So PRS Center 1 has four different cohorts contributing, none of which meet the criteria that I mentioned to you before with the 10,000 from a non-European ancestry group, but collectively they do. PRS Center 2 has five has three cohorts, each of which do meet that criterion, but they've decided to apply together to build on some existing efforts that they um, already have undergoing. And then PRS Center 3 is kind of a super cohort, which has um, enough participants to meet the criteria that I showed you on the, uh, on the slide before. So any and all of these PRSCs would be eligible to apply. OK, so each PRSC would be expected to contribute to cross-consortium analysis, which is really the, the strength and focus of this consortium. They would agree to maximize sample sizes as well as genetic diversity that were available for these cross-consortium analyses. We recognize that there's likely to be a lot of heterogeneous data, availability of clinical data, for example, data use limitations, and the availability of summary statistics versus individual level data. And the PRSCs would be expected to identify and address these challenges to really maximize the opportunity for these collaborative analyses. The centers will also identify and, and provide the expertise to harmonize these health and disease measures for analysis. This is not a trivial undertaking for those of, those of you who are in consortia, I'm, I'm sure you, um, you empathize about that. And then the centers will work together and with the coordinating center to integrate ancestry into the PRS analysis, to identify metrics for improving PRS prediction in non-European populations, and then to continue to refine the PRS based on updated data that will likely be available throughout the consortium. Okay, the second RFA in this concept is for a coordinating center to provide overall logistic and scientific coordination. Because of the scope of the data integration, we are proposing a major data science component here, which the coordinating center would lead. This would include proposing fair approaches that's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable to data integration and analysis. So going just beyond what should be integrate, uh, what should be harmonized, but really proposing ways to do this and that are in, in accordance with fair principles. And we don't anticipate that we'll have to start from scratch with a lot of the, the existing standards and data sharing policies in place. So the coordinating center will be working with the ANVIL and external standards group as needed. 
The CC will lead the genotype imputation, as well as take the lead in disseminating PRS results on behalf of the consortium. There are likely to be LC issues that arise during the course of this consortium, and the CC will provide or convene the appropriate LC expertise. These could include issues um, such as uh, related to data sharing or perhaps the way in which populations are, are labeled or described. The idea of affiliate studies will be an important one here. The CC will provide limited support for studies which may not be funded as part of the PRSCs or which may uh, not have had data ready to, so, to apply for the PRSCs, um, but will have data uh, available during the course of the consortium. Or perhaps there's a, a consortium who's already funded to do similar work, and they just need a little bit of support to be brought into this uh, collaborative structure. And so the coordinating center will provide limited travel and, and personnel support for these studies to be included. And then finally, we do have a line in the budget for very limited genotyping in year one for high value populations for whom there are data lacking. So here's just a simple cartoon of what a PRS consortium might look like with five funded center, centers, a coordinating center, and a, an affiliate study. Um, I'll, I'll work out for you how we see the structure of the analysis um, happening, but suffice to say that we envision that this effort will fold in a number of already existing cohorts and build on what they've already done. So as I alluded to before, the analyses for these trait-specific PRS will be done at the level of working groups. These really will be the focal point for uh, analytic issues. Within each working group, there will be experts representing each cohort to provide domain expertise in phenotype harmonization and doing the analysis and um, thinking about how the genomic data relate to clinical data. Um, one, one feature of this type of model is that the centers would be funded to uh, provide analysis effort to all contributing cohorts. And then here's a cartoon of a hypothetical coronary heart disease working group where you can see that there are four cohorts that were funded as part of the PRSCs and three affiliate studies that will be brought, would be brought in. Um, importantly for this particular working group, the link between the individual cohorts and the PRSC to which they belong um, is, is not as important as the ability for this working group to come together and do the PRS analysis. Okay, so what are the deliverables of the consortium? So the first is that we recognize the harmonized data uh, in terms of genotype and phenotype will be extremely valuable. At the very least, we see making available summary statistics and metadata. Uh, individual level or controlled access data will need to be uh, looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. We expect that a lot of these individual level data will already be available through some of the repositories. A second deliverable will be the actual models themselves, the SNPs, weights, covariates, and any other metadata needed to interpret and apply these PRS scores to external populations. Of course, tools and resources developed by the investigators. Um, hopefully, we won't have to be starting from scratch in terms of a lot of these data sharing policies, but uh, any new ones that will be developed as part of this consortium would be shared by the community. And then um, the data and approaches that would facilitate validation in clinical settings, I think, would also be very helpful. So I'll, I'll show you in a little bit how we see interacting with some of the more translational studies. Okay, so this is proposed as a five-year program, years one and two focusing on integrating data, convening the working groups, phenotype harmonization, and then consensus um, on what PRS approaches to use and how, how, uh, what, which metrics to use. So years two through, through years four are the key years for conducting the analyses, disseminating the data, and then refining models based on updated data. And then years four and year five will focus fully on disseminating the results and then refining the models further based on community input. Okay, so there's a lot of work, as I alluded to, in PRS going on. So if we think about just um, the use of a test in the lab versus the clinical uh, care setting, um, we can think about a spectrum from analytic validation, where you're looking at how the tests perform in the laboratory or in, 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 the, in the computational setting, all the way up to clinical utility, where the test is being evaluated in patient care. And so the concept that I've described to you here is more on the analytic validity side. Um, the eMERGE uh, 4 RFA, which you heard about um, a couple of councils ago, will be more in the realm of clinical utility with the design of their genomic implementation study, but we do see some opportunity to collaborate and overlap in the realm of clinical validation. 
And then I just wanted to point out that um, there will obviously be a lot of cohorts that are eligible to apply. Um, I've listed a few of these here. Um, we would obviously want to solicit very broadly, and so this is by no means exhaustive. Okay, and then one final word, we have a proposed budget of $33.8 million over five years. You can see the breakdown here. Each of the PRS centers uh, will have a, a, a proposed budget cap of a million dollars. That's to include all of the analysis, phenotype harmonization, um, and data integration work. The coordinating center would have a budget of 1.6 million to include all of the data science, the, the logistical coordination, as well as the affiliate studies for five years. And then I did separate out the limited genotyping effort in year one as needed, which would be part of the coordinating center. Okay, so that's the concept, and I think we'll open it up for discussion at this point, and how about we start with the two discussants, Dr. Haynes and Dr. Pritchard. Thanks, Lucia. Uh, I think this is great. There's a lot that I like here, and I have one main comment, which is that I think that the methods for data analysis for um, developing PRS scores um, uh, are still very much in flux. So I think there's, in, there's a lot of work to be done now on, on how to combine information across multiple populations, how to, you know, how to select SNPs, how to shrink the uh, effect sizes on SNPs, how to incorporate functional information which might improve, improve, your, improve one's priors, things like this. And so, um, so I guess I think that the main thing that's missing from this is an emphasis on um, you know, on, on supporting uh, methods development as well as 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 well as allowing this to be dynamic. So, in, in your flowchart, you talked about um, you know sort of fixing on some methods in years one and two, and then and then and then taking those forward through the consortium. And you know, you probably do imagine it's being more dynamic than that. But I I think I really would emphasize the the importance of you know allowing the the methods development to uh, you know to progress in that time. Thank you, thank you for that feedback. I, I, I do, I agree 100%. And actually, I think that the infrastructure that would be built by this consortium could be used for um, a, a, you know, a lot of sort of related purposes. I think methods development being one of them. The other thing I wanted to mention is that I think this could be sort of viewed as a preliminary effort to look at um, some you know, disease uh, genetic variant discovery studies more more generally. So this is you know clearly just trying to chew off PRS, but if you think about a framework for using existing data for uh, genetic discovery of new variants, you know, you could adapt something like this to that purpose as well. So Jonathan, the methods development could be done within the centers, or do we need independent groups doing that? I, I personally think that it makes more sense to have, uh, have those be independent because the, uh, you know, the, the, the groups that may be best uh, best position to contribute methods and not necessarily affiliated with these centers. Jonathan. So two, two points. Uh, one is I think the key word um, and the hardest thing you're going to have to deal with is the harmonization. And that's both at the, for the, the, the genetic data as well as the phenotype data. Because that's, I mean, we struggle with this all the time with all sorts of different platforms and different things and, you know, how the imputation is going to be and whether you're going to, I presume that, that if people have sequence data, that would also be okay as opposed to just genotype data. Um, so that's going to be a real struggle, I think, for, for these, and it's going to be a major, a major point. Um, the other question that I had was relative to the representation of the, of the non-European uh, sample data sets. If all the, one, all, the, all the grants that came in all had really good representation for, say, African American, but there was no Hispanic or South Asian or, you know, pick your other, other groups, how would you handle that? I mean, it would be unfortunate if you didn't have a broad representation of all the different groups that are out there. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll take the second one first. I, um, I, I think it is possible, although I would be very surprised if we didn't have any studies with Hispanic La Latino data that, that came in. I think we will have to, at the end, at, not at the end of the day, but at the time of funding decisions, have to look at trade-offs between being able to represent major population groups that we know have disease burdens in the United States versus where the data actually are. I mean, if, if literally everybody comes in and they only um, propose to use African-American data, then, you know, I think that's, that's, you know, a missed opportunity. And we might have to look at whether we could use the affiliate study 
um, approach to sort of bring in or solicit some of these other studies to participate. Um, but I think when we think about diversity, we're not only thinking about one group, we're thinking about major population groups that are representative of, of, of what we see in the United States. Um, and I'm sorry, remind me your first question. It was the harm? Did the, oh, the harmonization. The issue oh, yes. about harmonization. Yeah, I, I, I kind of wanted to forget that. No, not really. Um, no, so so yes, I, I'm I'm definitely aware that um, it will be a struggle. It will be a challenge. There are existing groups that have been working on on these kinds of issues for years. Um, I, I wonder if if you have tips for how we could you know at least make the expectations clearer in the RFA, or you know kind of maximize our ability to get groups who are going to dig in and do this. I, I, I wish I did as well. Um, I mean, certainly you, there's a certain level of, of how much genotyping has been done, you know, what sort of what chips. And if they're really old chips, you, you, you know, that, that's not so great. You'd, and I think the groups would, would quickly come to an agreement as to if they're going to do imputation to what panel they're going to impute and things like that and, you know, what panels are good. But then with the diversity, you know, that, that sometimes becomes an issue. I, I'm a little more worried about the phenotype, and Josh would know more about this than, than, than I do, but the phenotype harmonization across there, because what, you, what I would hope you wouldn't end up doing is going to least common denominators on the phenotype just because that way you can get however many you want, when I presume that there would be a number of different phenotypes, and perhaps it would be good to get an idea from you, how many different phenotypes are you, do you think that the groups would actually end up working on? So I think that... I think what we would like to say is we'd like to see um, multiple and broad. I think that's that is an issue of, of judgment because we, I mean, just in the cohorts that I know the best, there are, for example, cancer cohorts, but they have anthropometric data, they have diabetes data, and so while, while they may view themselves as a cancer cohort, they actually have a lot of measures. And so I would say that you know probably many of these cohorts are likely to have anthropometry, for example. Um, so you know there are some basic measures that we could probably consider to be used across different cohorts. But I do think that um, we'll have to write into the RFA the ability um, and perhaps, you know, propose a way to describe all of the different phenotypes um, so that we sort of know what people are prepared to bring to the table. Josh? Yeah, my questions were um, along the same vein. What's your expectation in terms of number and the um, phenotypes people might explore and the degree to which a group should be able to participate in many different phenotypes and maybe trying to make that more clear in the as, as this progresses past concept um, phase that, that, you know, it actually um, got some uh, more detail around uh, groups trying to say how many different phenotypes they could potentially explore. Do you have thoughts on numbers and applicability to numbers of phenotypes or how many yeah, groups right, right. have broad phenotypes? Um, so no, not how many I, groups have broad yeah, phenotypes. Yeah, the numbers. Former, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really hard to say a number because I, I think if we threw out a number, there would likely be a trade off between how many groups have the quality of those phenotype data and what the diversity looks like. I, we had a lot of discussions at NHGRI about like, how do we think about clinical data? Because ideally, you'd, you'd have clinical data on everybody. But I think the reality is we know that the best data is going to be in the, you know, the populations that are studied the best, and those tend not to be European Americans. So, um, you know, I, I don't have a great answer, except for I think we'd like we'd like several from each cohort at spanning, you know, multiple organ systems just as a, as a, as a pass. Um, but I, I think we'll we'll need to think about that more clearly in the RFA. Follow up. Yeah, I have another okay. brief follow up. I think it's evident here, but in terms of just looking at the dynamics of the population size, a large population that was less than fifty percent diverse, but had more than had twenty or thirty thousand, we'll say, make up a number of of, of diverse ancestries, um, uh, with maybe each ancestry being at least ten k. Um, that would meet the criteria even if they were 30% diverse total. 100,000 people, but 30%. Because otherwise they yeah. could just say, because you'd say, well, we'll just cut our cohort in half, and then they artificially make the number smaller to just ca talk about 30,000 diverse ancestry. So I mean, I, I, think, I think this is a point worth discussing perhaps. Uh, we, we talked about it at NHGRI as well, but you know, when you have these models, which are, which are weighting SNPs, for example, based on their effect sizes, those are really dependent on who you have in the population. And a lot of the GWAS data were done in Europeans. And so I think we really are going to ask uh, applicants, you know, 50% is the right number, but you know, they really need to have a preponderance of, of, uh, of diverse data from non-European populations. So I think that was one thing we felt fairly strongly about, that, that you know, the, the biases would not um, be um, propagated in this 
consortium. Just for sake of argument here, let's say you had 10 million people, but 1 million were diverse. Yeah, I know. Um, so I, mean, you, I, I you, think you could just say the one million is your population. I mean, it, but yeah. it's just a right. It's it's an artifact of how you describe the application. So it might, I don't know. It might be better to talk about the numbers of diverse ancestries. Would be my vote, but yeah. a consideration. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we'll take that in, into advisement because I, I think when you know when you talk about large numbers like that, it, it is really hard to argue with. You know. The, um, the sheer number of individuals, but I, I think we do have to think very clearly about how some of these models might be biased by, you know, having overwhelmingly large numbers of Europeans. And yeah, um, Jonathan, did you want to yeah. make a if point? If I to just that? follow on on this yeah, point, yeah. Uh, you know, I think this it relates to the argument I was making earlier that we don't actually have very good ways yet of, of combining the information across populations. So, you know, ideally you could you could imagine statistical methods where you're you're trying to fit some. Uh, you know, some some mixture of effect sizes in, in different populations, and uh, you know, you want to basically leverage information ac across populations. So, you know, if, if it should be the case that having a you know a, a larger sample size in in, in European Americans would help your uh, pr your uh, your prediction in African Americans, but you know, as, as you say, there's a trade-off. But you know, more data has to be better. Um, uh, but but I think actually the bottom line is that you know. There aren't really very good methods for, for doing the data analysis at this point. And so you know, some of we don't actually really know very well what the trade-offs are going to be in half a dozen years down the road. OK, I've got Sharon, I've got Jeff, I've got Trey, and Mark, and then Wendy. Yeah, I mean, there, there are major efforts going on with regard to phenotyping, both with regard to the work done in Emerge, but now, you know, the Monarch Initiative. And, and I hope that we're not going to have these groups not take advantage of those efforts. Um, because, you know, because you mentioned all the work around phenotyping. So th they're going to have to take the phenotypes they have and harmonize them, but there are, you know, major efforts to help groups, certainly the Mendelian project as well. So again, I'm a little concerned about all these groups repeating efforts around phenotyping. Um, and I hope we're really benefiting from the work that is going on in, in a number of these efforts to facilitate how phenotyping is being done in, in these studies. I wasn't, I mean, just kind of a point of clarification, I wasn't completely clear whether you're assuming the genotypes or the sequence exist or they just have the people. They, we are talking about existing genomic data and sequence data with the exception of the limited genotyping that I put at the end there. Okay, so, so they, then yeah, all of those sense. funds are being allocated to analysis. Yes. Okay. And, and her, I mean, her analysis meaning the data integration, the phenotype harmonization, everything that leads up to the analysis. Okay. Yeah. Jeff. Yeah, it seems to me the whole polygenic risk score enterprise is very much dependent on the clinical utility uh, out the other end. And so I want to express concern about an enterprise of this size that isn't tackling that directly. Now, it seems to me, and others around the table probably have much more knowledge than I do, that the knowledge we have uh, to date doesn't really suggest that risk information is very motivating in terms of long-term behavior change. And it's also unclear how that gets integrated into clinical decision making and how you eventually follow up those folks to the extent that you can determine whether there's an impact on health. So there's a lot of problems with the clinical utility piece, but I'm a bit reassured by the suggestion that this will feed into the eMERGE pipeline and we'll get that research done later. But I wanted to express my concern that there perhaps ought to be a clinical utility enterprise as part of this effort that also gives us information about how different population groups respond to information and what sort of access they have to um, behavioral interventions, drug interventions, et cetera, that might impact their risk information. So uh, I don't really have any more reassurance for me that uh, this is a piece that's going to be taken care of. So I, I definitely take your point in terms of how groups will use the information. I guess um, where I'm struggling to make a link is in this consortium where we have basically analysis of existing data, um, how do we make that link um, to you know, participants who would be you know, 
for potentially receiving information um, in some other setting. Maybe that would be emerge, and it, it looks like this consortium and emerge looking together. Um, I also did mention briefly that the coordinating center would um, be well. You know, we would write this into the RFA that they would um, be responsible for providing and convening LC expertise. So perhaps there would be an opportunity to have like a workshop. Um, or such, but you know, we would not be proposing, for example, to return any results to participants as part of this uh, consortium. But I, I agree, I agree it's needed. I don't know, Terry, if you want to say anything more about the implementation side of things and how these fit together. Sure. You know, one of the reasons that Lucia is bringing this forward is that we do recognize the short. You know, the shortcomings of the data we currently have uh, to be able to do something in the Emerge Genomic Risk Assessment Program. This one really is focused on data analysis, and were we to include a component of providing results back and assessing clinical utility in this one, the cost would be much, much more than, than what's being proposed here. So we, you know, we all work together. We're expecting that there will be some overlap among investigators, and, and I think, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that these efforts synergize, which your point is well taken. Yeah, so at this point in the conversation, I think my point is, is mainly reduced to a second of Jonathan Pritchard's points about the importance of analysis. And, and you know, Terry seemed to also suggest that was the focus here. So I'm very concerned as this is now perceived, uh, analysis is going to get thrown under the bus. And instead, what you're going to have is, is, is the usual suspects who are very good at databases come in and just build you a massive database. Um, and, and you know, for one point six million dollars a year, that's 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 cheap, you know. Um, so one minimal suggestion would be instead of calling it a coordinating center, call it analysis center. Um, the problem with that, of course, gets back to Jonathan Haynes' point that then you're going to throw under the bus harmonization and the important database construction. And so I I'd also like Jonathan Pritchard's. Oh, sorry, I have to keep using last names here. Uh, a point that, that you might consider a separate center called the Data Analysis Center. And, and there is precedence, of course, for that and other, other consortia like this. So can I, can I follow up on that a little bit? So um, how would the Data Analysis Center intersect with the work, kind of the working group model where individuals from each of the cohorts would be you know, prepared? I don't know if meta-analysis is the right framework, whatever the framework is, for those cohorts to be analyzing data. So can you say a little bit more about what, what the needs of the analysis center would be that would, that would be met? I'm not quite sure I got the, the question. Sorry. Um, can you say a little bit more about what you think the analysis center would do? Um, be, because the, so the working group, let's see, maybe I can go back. Oops, right here. Um, so, so this is a proposed, you know, working group model for uh, an analysis of coronary heart disease. And, and we have sort of individuals from each cohort uh, providing analysis expertise. So how, how would you see the analysis center fitting into that? I, I see. So your point is there already is analysis going on in the separate the separate centers? Yes, that, that, that's what's proposed. But I, I I'm see. wondering well, if... Well, yeah. I think there maybe then, and, and I'll let others also comment, I think there the concern would be there's also a lot of data collection going on in those centers, yeah. presumably. And, and, and again, a um, million dollars a year for each isn't going to leave a whole lot of room for, for, for a huge activity that needs to be focused on, which is how in the world are we going to actually construct accurate PRS scores uh, uh, in the future, you know, now and in the future? Uh, I, you know, enough said, maybe. Yeah. No, I, I see where you're coming from. Yeah, and if, if I could just comment, I, we agree with you. We, we're not proposing to support through this initiative additional data collection efforts. We, we really are supporting the analysis component of it. Um, and our, our expectation is that this coordinating center would do more than arrange meetings. I mean, that it really would have the expertise to, to help guide and, and coordinate those analyses. Yeah, so, so, so in that case, maybe just coordinating is, is what I'm getting. Just the name of the very thing is, is really maybe sending an interesting message. We may call message. it something else. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it varies from place to place, um, you know, what you, what you name these things. And as, as uh, Sharon pointed out, you know, we don't have complete standardization because it, everyone has different needs. So, so uh, maybe let's not get caught up on calling it a coordinating center. It's, it's going to, I think, address the functions. And we've heard your concerns about being sure that it addresses analysis as well as other things. Met as well as methods. So yeah. I've got a cue, but I see Jonathan itching to get in on this point. 
Yeah, so I, I just wanted to clarify, I think it's not just about analysis, it's about methods, because I don't think we have the methods in place yet that are going to be the right methods yeah. in the future. That's what I mean when I say Thank you. Okay, methods development. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, yeah. I, yeah, no, I, I, see I, I had a from. separate point, but I don't know if other people want to go mm -hmm. first. Then you have to wait in the queue. <laughs> 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 okay, so I've got Mark, Wendy, that Jonathan, Rafa, and Gail. Okay. So I just had a, a follow up to what Jonathan Prisher brought up and, and Trey, and, and that is, again, just to, I think, emphasize the, the the need and the role of novel methods here. And in particular, I think what's complementary to recruiting a diverse population is, is there's interesting work going on on how can you, when you know you have lack of representation in your sample, how can you compensate for that? And I don't know if this, this work has made its way into genetics yet, but there's nice work in truncated statistics. Uh, I brought up a paper by Constantinos Daskalakis. I brought it up so I can remember his name, who's doing really wor nice work here that seems applicable. And I think if there's a way to try to bring some of these innovators into this enterprise, it would make, it would have a lot of value. Okay, thank you. Sure, so I wanna go back to Jeff point, Jeff's point, which is that the clinical utility of this, I think is really important. And so I'm asking Jonathan Pritchard and Lucia and others, um, given that we still need methods to develop, can you prognosticate or try and anticipate how long it's going to take for this with the idea that as Lucia put up there, I think Emerge would be, Emerge 4 would be a way to test this out. And I'm trying to think of the timing of the pieces and how all of that fits together, um, given that Emerge 4 will be coming out relatively soon. And this feels to me like it's still got quite a bit of methods development in certain communities, at least. And I'm trying to think about the timing and how the pieces are going to fit together here. I don't quite know how to prognosticate that, but um, you know, the I mean, the rate of improvement of these methods has been really uh, of the methods and the analysis and the results has been uh, really uh, rapid. I think so. You know, I you know, I, I do think that in the life within the life scale of the project lifespan of the project that you're talking about, that um, you know, we could get to a point where where these methods are um, you know close to clinical utility. Um, yeah, so I, I, you know, I, I do think it's potentially. I mean, I was just trying right to be even more concrete, and Terry and Lucia know this is that Emerge Four, given that it'll be funded within the next, I don't know, six to nine months or something. Well, say next year or something. You know, as that's going, I'm just trying to figure out: is you know, is Emerge Four going to be ready? Is are they going to be stalling, waiting for this to come forward, or is it like in the next two years that this is ready? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's tricky. I you know I think Wendy, like many things we do, these are going to be evolving as we do them, um, and we wouldn't want them to stop evolving, but we wouldn't want to stop the pro progress either. I was going to say something similar. I, I think that a lot of things are going to be happening in, in parallel. And I think, um, you know, if we just look at some of the early years of, of what is proposed in this consortium, the data integration and phenotype harmonization, as we discussed, is not trivial. So you know, maybe it's reasonable that there would also be some methods development in the early years as well. Um, so all of this obviously happening in parallel with, with Emerge. So. Okay. Assuming you can remember, you're still in the queue, Jonathan. <laughs> so, so actually, I think that my... Uh, my other comment relates a bit to your point. So one of the real challenges in bringing these scores into the clinic is integrating them with all of the other kinds of measures that are already used in the clinic. So, you know, for example, if you're thinking about heart disease, that's going to include lipid levels and, and BMI and, and um, uh, you know, family history and things like that. And so, you know, as you know, in mo most of the PRS literature are present, they're just using sort of time point, you know, single time point GWAS data. And so they're, they're predicting in the absence of all of that other kind of information. And so what I think, one thing I think could really be valuable for this consortium is to encourage people to come in with, with data where they have follow-up data set. So, you know, even if it's only in a subset of the samples, you know, maybe you maybe you've recruited individuals 10 years ago, you, you have some phenotypic measurements at baseline, and then you know uh, who who has incident um, 
disease during the during ten years of follow up, and you know, in, and in that setting, you can potentially combine PRS information with, um, uh, you know, with, with these other kinds of non genetic information, and you know, so I think that that would really be mm -hmm. valuable as, as st for stepping towards clinical utility. Yeah, yeah we we had thought about um, you know uh, writing the RFA such that. Uh, groups would describe not just the genotype and phenotype data that they would have, but potential clinical data, and we, we could add longitudinal to that. That makes a lot of sense. So I want to second the point again of the importance of development of methods, but I think I'm a little bit more, even more extreme um, in how, how important it is. Some of the things that are listed there, if you go back one slide, I don't think you can choose it right until you know what the methods are. Um, so you'll you'll make wrong decisions. You'll d implement all these things and then later on find out because the right method comes along and demonstrates that you had to do all this in a different way. Um, so with that said, I also wonder why, if we're already funding Anvil, we're already funding Emerge, which takes care of the data uh, availability and the phenotyping why isn't it why why isn't this just a project where you fund method developers and why, why are the centers involved at all if they already produce the data and well I, I think we need the actual I mean a couple things so I, I think the act of bringing the data together is not trivial and I don't think that's something that would exist if we didn't have a kind of model where sites were funded to bring their data. And then I think, you know, the, the analysis would be sort of a corollary to the methods development where once there was, you know, some methods development that the consortium agreed would be um, a good one to pursue, then the analysis would actually need to be done um, as, you know, as, as, a, as a part of generating the scores and making them available and handing them off to the translational side. And if so, I could could just add, the, the Anvil, uh, Raphael, is, is only an HGRI funded study. So, so what Lucia is trying to do here is to gather in um, studies that, that we haven't had anything to do with, basically, and, and try to get those data into our databases. Right now, as hard as we've tried, our, our data are 85% European ancestry, and that's not going to solve this problem. I guess it, the fact that this, this data is public, right? We paid for it. It's not public? You may have paid for it, but it's in somebody's... Much of this has never been submitted. It's in somebody's computer system that's probably totally different than the format you're going to yeah. want. It's not like you can just reach out and grab it. So you are going to have to pay. I mean, I agree with the discussion. I'm just trying to explain. If, if someone's got a type 2 diabetes data set that they did in Native Americans for a grant they had a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. let's just take that scenario, and you now go, wow, this is a great, they go, this is a great use of our data. This, I agree, you're not paying them to read genotype, but you are paying them to get the phenotype and the genotype. The genotypes probably may be in the, in the form you want. The, the phenotype certainly won't be. And, and uh, there may be additional phenotypes that were not part of that grant that that, that cohort also has and would be that they have uh, to really go back, back and get these, that they would yeah go back and and, and get go back and get interview people again go I'm, go, I'm go, go, go back the to their medical records yeah. and re-extract it and or back to whatever data collection the surveys survey data or something yeah, yeah. oh I'm sorry. If it's on this point, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Gail. Um, so, so this is what I've heard called data wrangling a lot. This is data wrangling, and, and it is important. Um, it's not clear to me that it's so important that, that um, you need to devote. I mean, right, right now, by essentially, if I, as I understand the design of this, these five centers are all data wranglers then. And they're all getting, and then they're going to result in data being put into Anvil. However, you, you, it sounds like you already may have a pretty good idea of what data sets you think should be in Anvil. In which case, you could just um, tell the data coordinating center that they're responsible for the data wrangling um, as, as well. I've seen, I've seen this done in other institutes. 
by the way, um, um, just to kind of push back on this, you know, again, part of it is I think I, I'm not sure I fully understand the, the intended structure here, but but one could imagine a structure, again, just to really take this idea that, that Raphael now is pushing um, to an extreme and, and say, look, the, there are five methods development centers. There is one data coordinating and wrangling center that is responsible for collecting the following data sets and harmonizing. A anyway. There are other designs here, I think. That yeah, could be considered. I, I mean, I, I think that's an interesting one. I I think that the the idea for the PRSCs was that they would do some data wrangling, but that's not all they would do. I, I think the phenotype harmonization really, I mean, that's it's not a trivial thing. I, I don't think we can say that these these sites will only do methods development unless you're including phenotype harmonization yeah. as part of that. So, so, so maybe the summary is these are all important points. Yeah. Several of us feel that you're throwing the methods under right. the bus at no, the moment. No, I take that point. Okay, Gail. I'm glad I didn't go first. This is really, this has been one of the most interesting discussions that I've heard, and also the one that raises a really critical ELSI issue that no research is ethical if, if it's not scientifically valid. And so I would join the methods bus and really push that really hard because that seems to me to be just critical and the little I know that I've heard some talks about this read a couple of articles one that apparently you've published you've put one of the Jonathan's has got an article it's not really published but it's in some secret site <laughs> we have something on bio archive <laughs> and yeah that's it no but the point is it's extremely uh, troubling, and it could unleash really negative consequences if this is done poorly uh, for for groups, which Elsie is really interested in, for population groups, and however you define them, which is, of course, a really important scientific as well as Elsie issue. And so I think this has been, uh, I, I can't recall something that's generated this much concern about and therefore about the structure of something that's gonna, that you guys are proposing than, than this has. So I think it's noteworthy and fascinating. Um, but my, my other point, which um, you, you guys may have heard earlier, but I would just want to say again is um, be, uh, who's really going to be in charge of some kind of um, oversight over how these things get employed moving forward whether it's the kind of uh, clinical utility that Jeff and Wendy discussed, or Epic One has got its module that you just plug into your, you know, the medical record and with you, all your patients have been genotyped and hooray, and we can do a risk score, and so this is what you tell your patients, which is probably going to come faster than he predicts anything is going to come. So, but so it's simply the, the I, I don't think... NIH or NHGRI is, is comfortable letting researchers um, argue policy and say, well, my research has shown this, therefore I'm going to recommend this kind of policy. And yet I think policy and um, requirements need to be disseminated somehow, maybe through journals, maybe through scientific meetings, maybe nobody else is worried about this, but I'm really worried about this because it could have such a negative consequence for, for already uh, disadvantaged populations. Yeah, so I mean, we, we hear the feedback about the methods development, and I'm, I'm hearing feedback about these kinds of data and analyses will have important implications for clinical utility. I, I think, you know, this consortium isn't going to be able to take on everything, but I think the parts that we can take on and I think worth work with consortia like Emerge, especially the clinical utility piece, we will we will try and do that. So I, I just want to make the point that historic involvement in data wrangling does not exclude institutional expertise in data analysis or methods development. And in fact, often the two go hand in hand. And the methods that are developed could be as good as anyone would hope for, but if, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So you've got to have people who are harmonizing the data, making sure that, you know, they are of the highest quality. Um, I think that the review panel is going to be able to find the best compromise between who's bringing data to the table and who can meaningfully, substantively contribute to data analysis. Maybe one thing that's possible is to leave open the opportunity that centers 
uh, or sites can be recruited exclusively for methods development and data analysis. Other sites would be more heavily weighed toward mm -hmm. bringing quality data to the table and then a combination of the two. So um, I don't know that there's as discrete a segregation of, of talent and expertise as what, what we're imagining. Jonathan, and then we have a staff. Comment. So I'm going to go back to one of the first things I said, which is going to go back to something that Trey's been talking about, which is the, the harmonization, the data wrangling is not trivial at all. And I think that you know every one, of the, every one of the cohorts, every one of the sites is going to have to do a lot of work to get the data into a form in which you could actually, com actually combine it. So I, I think that just being able to pull together those data, both the phenotype and the, and the genotype data from cohorts, and not every cohort is going to be one, as I think Terry pointed out, that NHGRI already has in its, in its portfolio. And I think the opportunity to bring in other, other data sets uh, is is tremendous. I very much uh, appreciate the other Jonathan's point uh, about methods development, but I think the time frame by which the data wrangling is going to get to a point where you could actually do something with the data is going to allow a lot of methods development to happen. Now, I, I could see adding a methods development component to this specifically to try to to try to get that in, but I I. I think this is a very valuable, very worthwhile thing to do, and I do think that, that there's a lot that can be done. The LC components, I mean, you mentioned that the coordinating center would have an LC component, and actually when you said that, I, I worried a little bit that it wouldn't be big enough, and it wouldn't help to, to address some of, some of those issues, but I'm not quite sure how, how, to, how to address that. But I, I do think that the, you know, getting this off the ground now will allow us to handle some of those issues going forward. So just to clarify, you said the methods development is going to continue to happen. You mean outside of this RFA? I, outside of this RFA, but I think it could happen within this RFA as well if, if it was expanded to have like a, a specific methods development component. Okay, Josh, and then Jennifer, we will get to you. I, 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 just to follow up on Haynes's comment, um, the um, uh, I think you know if you think about the uh, first, just to echo, this is a huge issue. If you think about the component that would um, uh, really uh, a critical first step to make this succeed or not, it's going to be if you actually get the data sets together. And you know, I'll, I'll echo that the, the data wrangling is a huge issue. I don't think it would be as successful in bringing together a lar as large and a diverse set of groups if you know you tried to ask uh, a, a data coordinating center to come in and try to grab everyone. I, I, I think because it you know there'll be a lot of creativity in where you find these cohorts and the people who know are interested in disease X will know about the little communities that, that are sitting at the cohorts that they can bring together and they'll have such a passion, maybe more so and more knowledge about pulling those groups together. Once you have that diverse cohort together, then that gives you lots of opportunities, whether within this particular series of awards or another series of awards to you know build more methods on top of that. So I guess from that standpoint, I, I, I favor the idea of, of the sites bringing them in. I think each of the, a lot of the awardees will come in and want to do methods development, you know, simultaneous with pulling the data sets together because most of them probably will have passions for series of diseases. Okay, Jennifer. Does Gail, do you have on this point? I think okay, Jennifer. So I can be really quick. Um, so actually, Josh made one of my points, but I'm going to say one thing with my NHGRI hat, which is that we really do hope that that these will be a locus of opportunities for all things PRS, including biological understanding. We don't want to forget that piece. Clinical utility is important, but things can go backwards and feed back to biological understanding. And then with my H3 Africa hat on, I'm just going to say. In terms of the data being available, remember that a lot of these populations we're talking about are sensitive populations, and I think that if those um, scientists are not involved in the data wrangling piece, it will be viewed a lot differently. So having these centers where, where people are bringing their own data rather than the data is being wrangled, I 
in a separate location, I think is important. I've got Gail and Jeff. Yeah, I appreciate what you said about the ELSI components. And what I want to remind people, well, I, I communicated with Lucia because I thought perhaps there would be an, some, an LC, a kind of parallel, embedded, uh, auxiliary LC RFA that could go along with that because there's a lot of really interesting issues, some of which I think challenge people's kind of classic ideas of, well, there will be, you know, policy standards and, and also LC, you know, not to criticize you at all because you've been a real proponent of embedding LC work. And that is social studies of science which is the science and technology studies uh, part, which, um, which requires deep understanding of methods and science, but also of the interactions between, or if somebody should be an ethnographer at this group. Um, and, and in addition, the, the ideas that, that we've talked about, about sort of translation, um, again, also require knowledge of big data, knowledge of sort of the, the, the clinical translational process that we're all thinking is going to happen like that. But, but there's, there are different kinds of LC studies that could be, um, that we could call for that I think, and again, I'm sort of having trouble thinking on my feet. Uh, but just to say, there's a, I think there's a wealth of possibilities in the LC program that could be called upon to add to the, you know, the mix here, you know, group population, et, et cetera, dis disparities in you know, our understandings of what those mean, and wrangling the data, um, that scares me, frankly, because I think that we often, uh, um, we often uh, misclass cl misclassify a lot of different kinds of data, self-reports about who I am. I was Irish one day and Italian the next. Anyway, thank you, because I really think that that's a need with this program. Jeff. Yeah, and I saw the LCP says described as really being focused on the research, the conduct of the research itself. And I think that's very valuable and that's a, a good component uh, of this. You know, I'm more concerned a little bit down the road with the uh, clinical application. And we know this is being applied in the clinic already. So this is a very fast moving field. So I'm a little bit concerned that, you know, we're still working out methods. We're still trying to understand what the data mean. We don't have large segments of the population included, but yet you hear of people offering intelligence testing of human embryos, for example, using uh, polygenic risk scores. So um, I guess one additional thought here is with the Cancer Genetics Consortium now some 20 years ago, uh, there's a very productive activity early on that um, help guide clinicians to say, here are reasonable responses to um, genetic testing results. What should a woman with a BRCA1 mutation who's 25 years old do with respect to her clinical care? Now, that wasn't data-driven, but it was a set of recommendations that proved to be really quite influential. Those were very heavily uh, referenced papers, both with uh, uh, breast uh, BRCA1 and uh, uh, colon cancer uh, genetics. I wonder if there's an opportunity as part of the spectrum of activities to convene, um, if that's not already being done, uh, clinicians in these different areas. So the cardiovascular, what's a cardiovascular risk score mean for different patients and what would, what do knowledgeable people suggest you do with that information that's prudent uh, at this point? And presumably a lot of these folks have already had a cholesterol and a blood pressure measurement. And so does this provide independent information that's going to give you uh, a clinical rationale for doing something different? And that at least might serve as a foundation for then some of the clinical utility work that would say, you know, how are people complying with these recommendations? That they continue to make sense that there's some standard by which the information can be used by clinicians in a reasonable way early in this uh, technology development. Lucia, you might want to comment on the, the work you've done with NHLBI in terms of their cardiovascular PRS um, uh, workshop and their, their subsequent plans. I mean, this, this is something that happily other institutes are, are looking at. The Cancer Institute is very active in this area, and so is NHLBI. 
Yeah, so I think what Terry's referring to is that there was a workshop that was uh, sponsored by NHLBI where they talked about various aspects of uh, polygenic risk scores, the analysis as well as the clinical utility and perhaps even the public health implications. And um, they are one of several institutes that have approached us about potentially participating as part of this initiative. So I think we're very um, excited about that. Um, I, I think NHLBI brings a lot to the table as well in terms of the data sets that they have funded historically in the past. The um, I think the idea of sort of convening the clinicians is an interesting one. I hadn't thought about it for this particular initiative, but I mean, it might be something that we figure out where that belongs, if it's here, or if it's Emerge. I mean, I well, or, or working with the professional society. So, so we heard this morning from, you know, a whole group of professional societies that are working with us on genomic education. Uh, I'm sure that they would have clinicians interested in this as well. So, so we can certainly look at that. Trey? Yeah, so I do know, Rudy, this discussion is dragging on, so I'll try to be brief. But I, but I do think this has been a very interesting counter, you know, point and counterpoint where we now have essentially two extreme models, if you like, or two sides, where you have on the one hand, you know, a, 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 a federation of data wranglers of, uh, to, to really spur new and interesting data sets, as well as some expected ones from the community. And, and we've discussed the importance, and I think we all agree on the importance and, and difficulty of the data wrangling aspect. I think we also mostly all agree on, on um, the, the importance of new methods development to this process, and there, you know, the extreme would be you have a set of five, you know, methods development centers uh, and fewer data rank, you know, or data sets. And so, so uh, put that way, I'm just going to state, I think, I think the, the horse before the cart is you need the methods development, let many flowers bloom there first. I think it's a better strategic move to invite a bunch of different creative methods development, as, and as Harry points out, those can also be people who produce the data, of course. Uh, but but uh, really, I think if I if if I just think about it, if you know, a few years from now, you have a bunch of interesting new methods um, versus a bunch of interesting new data sets in the absence of many new interesting methods. You know, I, I think I choose the former. Yeah, I mean, th thanks for your feedback. Did, did you yeah, and if I, I could comment, on Aaron, I don't know if you wanted. To Comment as well. I, I, I totally agree um, on the on the methods development. I I think w we are struggling with the idea that methods developed in one ethnic subgroup may may not generalize in all cases to other ethnic subgroups because of differences among them. And and I think that would be a major concern if we focused on methods development without bringing more data sets in. Yeah, and I, I think that would be the opportunity here is to develop methods that apply to all populations. Right. Um, and, you know, I well, well, I think maybe one thing we could do is to think about whether there's some way to sort of have an and model so we right. can do methods. It's and just not and clear data. you can do both things with the current budget and ambition mm -hmm. of this. Yeah, I, that's, that, yeah that's the ultimate thing. That we'll have thing. to think about more. I think you're going to get one or the other. Mm -hmm. but, oh, can I just respond very quickly to Terry? Uh, you know, I, I think that actually the, you know, one of the biggest spaces of need for methods development is in cross-population methods that are going to integrate data in a sensible way. And, uh, you know, there's very little in that space that, that's suitable. So, you know, I, I think that the methods are needed for specifically that. If you could go back to the slide where you have, like, all of us in existing cohorts on there. I, I mean, I think part of the confusion here is, and to be honest, Nobody just wants to be a data wrangler, just so like people know. Um, I mean, there are people that do that because there's a project they want to participate in. Um, so I, I think part of it is it's just not clear from the design whether people are going to be applying, saying, I'm interested in type 2 diabetes. I'm going to bring my 10,000. And if this consortium actually does bring me another 30,000, here's the method I want to develop and apply to that group, or whether you're literally saying, here are my 30,000 people. Um, so, you know, H3 Africa was mentioned. So if they're applying, I'm still not, I'm, I'm not sure we understand what they're applying to, right? Um, they, they're going to have to, they're going to have to very clearly document their population and what genotyping has been done. And they may be able to say they're interested in a particular disease, but are they actually saying, and we've got experts on PRS, and with our population plus these other, this is the project I want to do, or I just want to join the club, and then we're going to 
figure out the project. So it's an Ignite was a little bit that way, right? So Ignite was, here's the project I want to do, but I'm also happy to do somebody else's project. Here's my population. And then they picked, is it that kind of model? I think this is where we're all struggling a little bit. Okay, I, I can I can talk that through a little bit. So the idea here is that each PRSC would be prepared to contribute data as well as uh, harm, harmonize data as well as analyze data. So if, if you had a, a data set or a cohort that was less experienced as far as the data analysis, data wrangling part, but they had the data, what we're trying to do here is, I think, incent people to come together prior to application. Um, the focus really is on the diversity, and so perhaps the smaller cohorts could join with some of the other larger efforts to collectively provide that analysis and harmonization and data wrangling expertise. I think we would need to think about the working in the methods development as well. So um, that would be the idea, is that they wouldn't just be contributing data sets, but also harmonization and analysis expertise. Does that help? Aaron, did you get tired of standing? <laughs> I was up and down getting my exercise. Is this on? I'm on. Um, so a couple points that I wanted to follow up on. We do have a growing um, investigator initiated set of R1 applications and PRS methods development, including methods to um, improve integration across diverse populations. So we are going to see some of those methods coming online and hopefully as these groups come together you could envision you know them coming in as part of the application and further developing their methods. And then the other point following up on sort of getting the clinicians together, one other piece in um, that hasn't been mentioned in ClinGen, we have a complex disease working group and that group has been working for over a year or two now to um, review the existing PRS literature and they were developing uh, a reporting matrix or framework at least to look and come to some consensus on what are important elements for PRS reporting. Uh, it's building on existing the existing um, GRIP statement from 2011 on improving reporting of um, genetic risk prediction. So there's that work that's happening as well and I can imagine there being good collaboration and communication with the working group the new um, funded centers and emerge. Okay, not to cut you off, but I'm not sure we can process much more. So if there aren't any final comments, I'm going to ask for a moment, for a motion rather, to uh, approve this concept, which includes two RFAs. Second. All in favor, hands up, one, two, three, four, five, six. okay, those opposed, and okay, are you opposed, Rafa? Okay, and those abstaining, four, okay. Kind of the outcome I would have expected from this discussion. Thank you for your feedback. Six, two, four, and uh, we've got Pat on, who's not on the phone, but is emailing me her score, so. All right, I think we have a much needed bio break that's next on the agenda. So let's convene at four o'clock, okay? Come back in open session for the council initiated discussion. <laughs>